I'm Molly Kilman with the Alabama Department of Public Health. Today's program is being brought to you by the Healthy Weight Initiative. The Healthy Weight Initiative works with after school and community programs to provide nutrition and health resources and training for those of you who are out working with children and their families on a day-to-day -day basis. Our presentation today is titled, Is Liquid Candy Harming Your Health? And you may be wondering, what does she mean by liquid candy? Well, I'm going to get to that in just a few moments. But I wanted to start off this presentation today by talking about the main ingredient in candy, and that's sugar. I've been a dietitian for about 15 years now, and sugar has really come into the spotlight in recent years, more so than I can ever remember. We have a slide here showing you some of the most recent headlines I've seen. This first headline I really like. It says, sugar becomes the new boogeyman as fats take a back seat. Like I said, I can really remember a time, a uh, long time ago, when fat really was in the spotlight. People were trying to eliminate fat completely from their diets. Food manufacturers were making low-fat versions of mayonnaise, of cookies, of ice cream. It was really in the forefront of the nutrition world. But recently, we've been hearing a lot more about sugar and some of the negative effects sugar can have on our health. The headline below this particular headline says FDA rejects the new name for high fructose corn syrup. Well, high fructose corn syrup is a type of sugar. And again, some negative publicity has come out about high fructose corn syrup, which I'll talk about in just a minute. And, um, Corn growers in the United States actually put forth a request to change their name from high fructose corn syrup to corn sugar to get away from that negative publicity. Well, you can see the FDA rejected that request. And so with all the negative publicity that sugar has received, the Sugar Association, the sugar growers, the corn growers um, are fighting back. Here is a website from the Sugar Association. And right there on their main home webpage, you can see they say, sugar is not empty calories. Well, that is most definitely debatable. Um, they also say that sugar can be part of a healthful diet. Again, that's very debatable. Another headline, consumption of high fructose corn syrup may play a role in obesity. Now, this this has really been um, an important issue because we all know that obesity is a significant problem in our country, and particularly in Alabama. And high fructose corn syrup has been shown to be metabolized differently in the body than regular sugar. Although there are some conflicting reports out there and some conflicting studies, so we're not exactly 100% sure yet if high fructose corn syrup really is the enemy, but we know that sugar in general is not good for us, especially when it's consumed too much. The United States Dietary Guidelines came out in 2010. And like I said, sugar's been at the forefront of a lot of negative reports and, and studies with adverse effects on health, so they really wanted to address it. And the U.S. Dietary Guidelines specifically state that Americans need to consume foods with less sodium, trans fat, cholesterol, added sugars, and refined grains. So there it is right there from our United States Department of Agriculture. They want us to reduce the amount of added sugars in our diet. So you may be asking yourself, well, what's the difference between added sugars and natural sugars? We'll talk about that right now. Okay, natural sugars. Naturally occurring sugars are just that. They are natural in certain foods. For example, milk and fruit. 
Natural sugars are usually found in foods that actually supply our body with nutrients that are good for us. So they're in foods that are already providing us with valuable nutrients and they also give that little bit of sweet taste that we like. On the other hand, added sugars are just that. They're added to foods and they're typically added to foods that are not supplying us with helpful nutrients. So those added sugars are said to be providing us with empty calories. There are no nutrients. So again, those added sugars are supplying us with nothing but extra calories. Sure, it gives us a sweet taste, but when we're consuming too many or too much added sugars, we're loading up on calories that maybe we don't even realize. It has been shown that added sugars make up a significant portion of our total calories in the American diet. It was recently reported that an average of 16% of our total calories in the American diet come from added sugars. That's a pretty significant number, I think, and we need to work together to bring these numbers down and make people more aware about how much calories are coming from these added sugars and what foods they're in. As far as recommendations for sugar, it has been suggested by the American Heart Association that we consume no more than six to nine teaspoons a day of added sugar. Okay, that equival equivalates to about 100 to 150 calories of added sugar a day. Now, we're currently consuming about 22 teaspoons a day. And some people may actually be consuming even more than that. We're getting nearly 400 calories a day from added sugars alone. That's significant. Unfortunately, our teens are consuming even more than that. So again, it's a very important topic to address. Children, they only need about three to four teaspoons a day. Again, that's a very small amount and children and teens and adults are consuming way more than that. What are the food sources of these added sugars? Again, the U.S. Dietary Guidelines came out in 2010. They provided us with this nice pie graph showing us where most of the added sugars were coming from in the American diet. All right, on the right-hand side, you can see that large green piece of the pie is made up of soda, energy drinks, and sports drinks, 36%. Also, down towards the bottom, you can see where fruit drinks are making up almost 11% of the added sugars in our diet. And then off to the left, there is a tiny slice for tea, three and a half percent. I have a feeling that down here in the south, that, that piece of the pie may actually be a little bit larger. But if you take those three statistics and put them together, you'll find that nearly half of the added sugars in our diet are coming from sweetened beverages, nearly 50%. And that is exactly what I mean by the phrase liquid candy. These are beverages that contain sugar and very little else to be helpful to our bodies. So to put that in perspective, let's talk about soda just for a second. All right, a 20 ounce soda con contains about 16 teaspoons of sugar, or in other words, about 65 grams of sugar. Well, what we want to remember is that the recommended amount for an adult is about six to nine teaspoons per day. And just one 20 ounce soda is giving you 16 teaspoons. Now, I know several people that they don't drink just one 20 ounce soda. They drink multiple 20 ounce sodas in a day. So this can really, really add up. I've brought a visual with me today to show you. Um, again, we have the 20 ounce soda here. And, like I said, some people drink more than one of these a day. 16 teaspoons of sugar. This is what 16 teaspoons of sugar 
looks like in a glass. You can see I have my teaspoon here. I measured all these out before we got started this morning. But the question is, looking at this glass of sugar, would anybody really want to just take a spoon and eat that? I doubt it. That's why I think this is a great visual for showing people, showing children, um, the amount of sugar that is in some of these beverages. And you can do this visual with sodas and some of these other sugar sweetened beverages that we'll talk about in just a minute. In comparison, I always like to show my empty glass to represent water. There is no sugar found in water. So the question is, would you rather consume all this sugar or quench your thirst with some water without all the added sugar? I think that can make a strong impact for a lot of people. Okay, so we're talking about sugar sweetened beverages and I just gave an example using soda. Well, sodas are not the only beverages out there with added sugar. There are many definitions for the term sugar sweetened beverages. And basically all it is is a beverage that contains added sugar. On this slide, you will see some of the different images of a sugar sweetened beverage. You can see it you know, encompasses a lot of different drinks. We have sports drinks. We have Kool-Aid, <laughs> energy drinks. Yes, even some of the flavored waters are considered a sugar sweetened beverages. Tea. Again, this is a, a, a beverage we love to consume down here in the South. Our sweet tea contains a significant amount of sugar. And then I always like to point out the Frappuccino over to the left. Uh, we know lots of teens um, and young adults are consuming these on a daily basis and they have much more sugar than you would ever expect. So again, we're not just talking about sugar, uh, I'm sorry, we're not just talking about soda, we're talking about any beverage that contains added sugar. And sugar sweetened beverages are also making some of the headlines recently. Some of you may remember Mayor Bloomberg in New York City. He recently came out wanting to ban any beverage in his city with more than 16 ounces in a serving. Basically, he's trying to get rid of the big gulp. And people are, some people are supportive, some people are not so supportive of his efforts. And right now, I believe they're taking comments um, from the public on this ban that he is proposing. Um, but that's just one step towards trying to um, create a healthier environment and create a healthier society. We know that reducing sugar sweetened beverages is one step towards decreasing obesity. Now, obesity, of course, is a very complex subject and requires multiple uh, steps towards reducing obesity, but sugar sweetened beverages is one approach to take. So just how much sugar sweetened beverages are being consumed in the United States? Well, we have one slide that is showing you the actual number of calories that is being consumed by Americans from sugar sweetened beverages. You'll notice right in the middle of the slide is the group consuming the most calories per day and that's our teenagers ages 12 to 19. You can see um, the boys are consuming about 273 calories per day from sugar sweetened beverages whereas the females are consuming about 170 calories per day. Um, what you'll notice too is in all the age groups, the, the males are always consuming more, which I thought was pretty interesting. But anyway, looking at this slide, you'll also see that our young adults are consuming the next highest amount of calories per day from sugar sweetened beverages. So what about in Alabama? What about Alabama's youth? How are we doing? What are we consuming each day? All right, when we're looking at data from the Centers for Disease Control around Alabama's youth, we will find that nearly 20% of our youth 
are consuming soda three or more times a day. And this is not including diet sodas. This is just uh, the sugary sodas and we are actually tied in first place with Mississippi for consumption of sodas in our youth. That's very disheartening um, to me to find out. And this is a new, this is a new statistic. This came out um, for 2011. So this is, again, why it's such a concern for us working with children and their families every day. Um, what, are, what are they consuming? How can we help them? How can we um, teach them about sugary drinks? When you look at the breakdown of males versus females, again, this is for Alabama youth. Again, our males are ahead of the females. 24% of our males are consuming three or more sodas per day. And 15% of our females are consuming three or more sodas a day. Again, no, no diet sodas, just full sodas. The national average is 11.3%. So in Alabama, we're well above the national average. And like I mentioned, we are actually ranked number one in the nation um, for soda consumption in our youth. That's pretty frightening. Uh, just to contrast these numbers, interestingly enough, our milk consumption is very low. In 2009, the same set of data showed that only 7.5% of Alabama's youth were consuming milk every day. So you can see there's been a real shift over the years away from milk towards soda. And we know milk has all those nutrients that a body needs to grow and develop and, and have strong bones, um, whereas a soda is leading to only extra calories and potentially obesity. So speaking of obesity, YRBS data from the Centers for Disease Control, again, Alabama's youth we have 17% of our youth are considered to be obese. Again, we are ranked number one in the United States for obesity in this age group. Very frightening. Again, we're number one in soda consumption. We're number one in obesity. Um, ranked number one in the United States. Our adults are also um, very much high up on the rankings. 33% of our adults are considered to be obese. And we're ranked number two in the United States. So again, this is a real issue for our state, something that needs to be addressed. So like I said earlier, decreasing or limiting the amount of sugary drinks in your diet every day may be a step towards reducing obesity. The American Academy of Pediatrics has also recently taken up this issue and they have released some statements, some very uh, serious position statements on their take on sugary drinks. And I'm going to show you just a few of the statements that I found on their website. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually read this slide out to you so that we can hear it word for word from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Sports drinks have a limited function for pediatric athletes. They should be ingested when there is need for rapid replenishment of carbohydrates and or electrolytes in combination with water during prolonged vigorous physical activity. Now this is a very interesting statement. First of all, let's talk about what a pediatric athlete is. Um, if your child or a child you're working with has been out in the neighborhood playing kickball with the neighborhood kids, that's really not considered a pediatric athlete. Um, if your child maybe has went outside to climb a tree and come back inside, um, again, that's not a pediatric athlete. We are talking about a child that is involved in um, organized sports activities. And the key point here, too, to remember is at the very bottom there, prolonged vigorous physical activity. That would be at least an hour of more of vigorous physical activity. Now, I, I talked about kickball. That's, you know, that's a sport or a game, really, where there is a lot of standing around. 
the kids line up. Um, if they kick the ball and it's caught, they're out. Um, so they're not really participating in prolonged vigorous physical activity by any means. And there are some other games and sports like that. So just, again, remember the term pediatric athlete when it comes to thinking about sports drinks. All right. Again, from the American Academy of Pediatrics, here's another one of their statements concerning sugary drinks. Routine ingestion of carbohydrate-containing sports drinks by children and adolescents should be avoided or restricted because they can increase the risk of overweight and obesity, as well as dental erosion. So there it is right there. These are from our our physicians across the country that are taking care of children, they are suggesting that you avoid and or restrict sports drinks for children. Energy drinks. We do consider this a sugary, a sugar sweetened beverage. And they're very popular right now, um, especially with our adolescents. And so again, the American Academy of, of Pediatrics has come out with their statement on energy drinks, and here it is for you. Energy drinks pose potential health risks because of the stimulants they contain and should never be consumed by children or adolescents. All right, that's a pretty strong statement. They don't say limited amount or avoid. They say should never be consumed by children or adolescents. So stop and think about whether you know a child or not or an adolescent who is consuming these type of beverages or even a young adult. There's no need for them. And we have a, a, a pretty strong statement here from the Academy about that. And then last of all, I really like this. The Academy is really supporting water. And they say that water, not sports drinks, should be the principal source of hydration for children and adolescents. So again, you can see that um, we want to encourage limiting or avoiding completely sugary, sweet beverages. And water should be the go-to drink, especially for children and adolescents, and even adults. Many state and national initiatives are occurring right now around this issue because, again, it is one step towards possibly reducing the amount of obesity that we're seeing in our youth and in our adults. So we have many states that are actually working on campaigns to promote more water and promote consuming less sugary drinks. Here's one example from Rhode Island. I really love this poster. Again, it goes back to the, to the visual aid I showed earlier. Um, you wouldn't let your kids eat this much sugar, so why would you let them drink it? I think this is a wonderful um, representation of, of everything we're talking about today. A great poster to share with your families that you're working with. Kansas. You can see here the Department of Public Health in Kansas is actually addressing um, drinking more water and consuming less sugar. the President and the First Lady. Well, we know that the President in 2010 signed the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act. And nutrition is a big focus of the President and the First Lady. Um, but in the, the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act, they're definitely encouraging more water in the schools. They're encouraging a lot of different guidelines for the schools um, that will take place this fall if they haven't already at your school. Um, but water is definitely one of those um, points that they're addressing. They want water to be accessible to the students during meals, free water. Um, they want it to be right there where the kids are eating their lunch so that they can have access to it at any time. The First Lady also has several initiative around her, her Let's Move campaign. And again, water is one of her key points in all of her initiative. Let's move child care. Again, they want water to be accessible to the children. They want it out on the playground. If you are working in a daycare, working in an after-school setting, or a community summer program for children, 
and you're outside playing, um, make, make water available. Take a pitcher out there with some plastic cups. Let the kids have access to the water um, at free will. So the Alabama Department of Public Health is also working to get the message out about drinking more water and fewer sweetened beverages. We have created some materials um, to, to provide to anyone who is interested in them um, about drinking a more healthful beverage. We've created this particular handout that's really cute and really informative. This is a good one for kids or for younger, um, younger adults. And again, it shows you the differences between consuming a soda versus water, um, showing you the calorie differences, and um, encouraging you to think about your drink and make a better choice. The Alabama Department of Public Health has also created a similar poster or handout um, that can be used for adults, and it's called Think About Your Drinks. Again, it's showing you the different beverages and how, much, uh, how many calories are in each one. If you were interested in seeing these posters, they are available on our website at adph.org backslash nutrition. That's adph.org backslash nutrition, and you would click on Healthy Lifestyles on the left-hand side, and you'll find these posters there. Or you could always contact me personally. My information will be up at the end of this presentation. You're welcome to, to email me or call me, and we can actually send you some of these posters if you would like some to hang up in your classroom or in your facility. It's a great reminder about thinking about your drink resources available to you. I wanted to share uh, some, some resources on this topic that may be helpful as you work to teach children and their families about having healthy behaviors. First of all, the CDC, again, they're really taking on this issue as well, and they've created a website. You can see it here on this slide. I will make sure to give you enough time to write that down if need be. Um, there, there is a water access in schools icon that you can click on for a lot of good information on the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act and why it's important to offer water in schools during the day. Also from the Centers for Disease Control we have the Beverage Bulletin. Now the Beverage Bulletin is from the CDC. It's a monthly email resource um, for anybody who's, you know, interested in supporting healthier beverage intake. To subscribe to that listserv, you can see the information here on this slide. You would email Beverly Kingsley at bbk9 at cdc.gov. And they'll sign you up and they'll send you emails on a monthly basis. This group has some really great resources. They, they have uh, calls from time to time or maybe it's a webinar and provide good information on this topic. Drink Water First, and that's www.drinkwaterfirst.com. This is a great website if you're working with children. Um, you can see they have some really interesting and colorful uh, pictures here and games. Um, they have a Think Your Drink calculator. Again, this would be a very useful tool in teaching children about making healthier choices when it comes to their beverages. So I encourage you to take a look at that website too. And then last of all, I don't want to forget the Dairy Association. As I mentioned earlier, we've really gotten away from milk and children are consuming less milk and consuming more sodas, sports drinks, um, and we want them to get back to the basics and consume more milk. So you can go to the Southeastern Dairy Association's website, which is listed here for you. It's www.southeastdairy.org. They also have just a ton of great resources about the importance of not only drinking milk, but consuming calcium-rich foods. Um, so again, feel free to take a look at their website and 
They have materials for parents. They have materials for the children that can be downloaded right off the website. So that concludes my presentation about liquid candy. I think now we have a better understanding of um, where you know, the added sugars are coming from, how much we're consuming every day, and why it's an issue for Alabama. I hope that you will take this information today and take it back to your programs and share with your students, share with your families the importance of making healthier beverage choices every day. If you have any questions, you're welcome to contact me after viewing this presentation today. I'm, I'm very accessible by email or phone and would be happy to talk to you um, about some materials or maybe um, some programs that could be implemented um, in your programs every day. So I just want to say thank you so much. Um, here is my contact information for you. My email address is there. My phone number is there. Again, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you so much for watching this presentation today. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you've learned something about making better beverage choices. Thank you so much.